Hi, Carol. Can, we can see you. Can Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Yep, I'm Lovely. here. So, um, thank you so much, um, Carol, for joining us. As you've seen, we have teachers from around the world. And we're at Macmillan. We're all very excited to have um, Carol with us today, especially as we have a brand new course, Mimi's Wheel, um, that Carol has, has written for um, the pre-primary years. And um, I almost feel embarrassed introducing Carol, because I'm sure you all know um, lots about her. Um, she's worked as a teacher, teacher trainer, academic manager, materials writer, education consultant, specialising in the early years, and lots of award-winning titles, including 500 activities in the primary classroom, which I know was um, probably the most used book when I was a teacher um, for all of the, the young learner um, teachers, and also Tiger Time, which I'm sure many of you use, and as I said, this brand new course. Um, and Carol, of course, is a former president of IATEFL. So it's our great pleasure to have um, you here today, Carol, and you're going to tell us all about social and emotional learning in the early years. So over to you. Okay, thanks, Mike, and thank you for that very nice introduction. And good morning, if it is morning where you are, and welcome to this webinar on social and emotional learning um, in the early years. And there you have a little outline actually about the seminar, um, and it's going to be a very practical session. Essentially, we're going to be looking at what are the really important areas in social and emotional learning in the early years and practical ways that we can go about integrating that into our English language lessons in the classroom. And my first question is, surprisingly enough, what is social and emotional learning? And I would like you now to, I'm not asking you for a definition, but just to think about what social and emotional learning means to you in general, and put your ideas in the chat box so that we can see um, the ideas that we share and if everyone's on the same page about that. Learning beyond me, fantastic. The ability to, lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, more ideas there. Yeah, okay, to interact with each other while they're learning, to learn from our social skills, fantastic. Help learners with their self-esteem, fabulous ideas. Yeah, stress, yeah, lovely, okay, fantastic. Building empathy, lots of ideas here. As a member of society, absolutely, the kind of citizenship idea, wonderful. Well, it looks as if um, you don't need this webinar at all. You obviously know all about social and emotional learning, and that is actually fantastic um, to see that we're all on the same page about this. And what I would like to just show you now is um, a definition of social and emotional learning. Um, social and emotional learning is the process which, through which children and adults understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relations, and make responsible decisions. So as we can see from that definition there, it is a huge area. And it's one of these areas that encompasses things that we talk a lot about in the 21st century, things like life skills, 21st century learning skills, the whole area of emotional and social intelligence. Um, but when we think about children, you know, this is obviously important for all of us and actually an essential foundation for thinking and learning, not just for pre-primary, but for primary, for secondary, for teenagers, for adults, for everyone. But thinking particularly now in a preschool context, I would like you to think, and also uh, for us to share ideas, is how do children develop social and emotional learning? What do you think? How, we know what it is. How do they develop it 
um, in, the, in, in a preschool context. Through play, through example, through play and interaction, fantastic ideas here, through, peer, through interaction with them, through practice, sharing. Gosh, what fantastic ideas you've got. Absolutely, I agree with all of those wholeheartedly. Safe and loved, yes, so important. Through role play, okay, through games, absolutely. What a lot of fantastic ideas you're coming up with there. And their parents' behavior as well is absolutely crucial. Okay, so let's actually pull these ideas together and identify some of the things that are really um, crucial for um, the way children develop social and emotional learning. And the first thing that I'd like to mention, you know, in a classroom context is through the way we create a warm and caring learning environment. And some of you've mentioned this already, that children need to feel valued and cared for by the teacher. And we need to create an environment that is colorful, that is stimulating, that um, displays children's own work, and that also there are thinking aids on display, and that it is also interactive. For example, when we have things like um, pictures of the children when they were babies, can you guess the baby, when we have a birthday chart that shows all their birthdays, and when we also provide an ongoing record of the learning that is taking place through, for example, posters or pictures of um, recent vocabulary items that we have learned. So that's one crucial area. The second one that I would like to mention is through the way we model and give um, an example that we actually, you know, if we want the children to greet us politely, if we want them to use um, words like please and thank you and sorry, then we need to actually um, model that ourselves. And very often we may actually use um, a class puppet. And I have to say that over the years um, I've used many different puppets because they are so crucial in providing this modeling, giving the example, and also adding to the warm and caring learning environment that I mentioned just previously. And over the years, I've used rabbits, I've used a tiger, I've used an oven glove like a crocodile, I've even used an umbrella that had um, a funny wooden head with a kind of dragon-like figure on it as a puppet. Um, and this morning, I'm going to actually introduce you um, to this puppet, um, okay, and her name is Mimi, and she's she's a bit shy about being here with me today, but she's waving and um, saying hello to you all, and we can use the puppet, of course, to greet children, to say goodbye, so that they know that the puppet is a warm, friendly, caring presence that they they get to know and get to love and um, feel safe and secure with. And of course, in terms of by example and modeling, we can also use our puppet to demonstrate activities. For example, if we were playing a little guessing game, I might ask Mimi, is it red Mimi? And she might go, she might shake her head and go, no. And I go, is it blue Mimi? And she nods and goes, yes. And this can be um, a lovely example for the children. Similarly, um, my next point in developing cell is um, that actually with very young children, it is really important the way we use praise, positive encouragement and give feedback. And we can also, while I've got the puppet in my hand, we can use our puppet, whatever puppet we're using, to give that kind of praise and encouragement as well. For example, you can get the puppet to whisper to you and say, Mimi says it's very good, okay? Or use the puppet directly to give this kind of encouragement. And I think we have to recognize that at this age group, the role of praise is very important 
in encouraging students participation and building their self-esteem and making them feel confident about being able to um, join in in the English lessons. I think the next, the next point in terms of creating and developing um, social and emotional learning, CEL, is to set clear expectations and parameters that we have to remember that this is just the start. Children are being socialized into school for the first time. They don't actually know how to behave. They're used to being little princesses and princes in their own homes. And suddenly they're in the social context of school. And we need to set clear expectations and parameters. And actually children have both a need and a right to know this and to know what the boundaries of um, behavior are. And this of course links to the next point, which is um, to do with positive classroom management and actually are managing the children proactively rather than reactively and actually thinking of our role in classroom management terms as training children in social social habits and good learning habits and rather than um, focusing the whole time on what children are not doing right to actually look for the things that they are doing right to acknowledge and praise these so that children actually learn over time that they get our attention um, and our positive attention when they are working within the kind of boundaries that, that we set up. We also need to um, provide opportunities for choice and decision making. But actually, in order to lay the foundations for children becoming responsible and um, independent learners um, in the future, we need to give them opportunities to choice for choice. This may be, for example, the order they do activities. It may be how to complete a project, whether colouring or painting. Um, it may be to do with things like um, the colours they use for a picture. It may be to do with when we talk about um, learning reviews, them actually deciding for themselves um, what they think um, that they've learned. Um, we also, children also develop cell through opportunities for agency and autonomy for actually, um, and this relates to the previous point, for learning how to direct themselves, for learning how to manage themselves, for self-regulation. And this can be to do with things such as actually learning their way around the different areas of the classroom, to do with giving out and collecting materials, for example, um, and actually being responsible for, um, for doing these things as much as possible for themselves. And um, they also, of course, develop social and emotional learning through age appropriate cell related um, activities. And of course, this is what we're going to um, go on and have a look at now. So the next big question, how does it work in practice? And I would say that methodologically speaking, um, it works in two ways, really. First of all, that we are actually, as preschool teachers, looking for every opportunity we have to enhance social and emotional learning within aspects of our everyday teaching. And I like the terms um, permeation. It's one used by Michael Byram, actually in relation to intercultural awareness, or the term used by Carol McGuinness in relation to thinking skills, infusion. So in other words, this idea of kind of osmosis, that it is an implicit part of the fabric of everything that we do um, in the classroom. Um, but also, of course, it is through specific activities and 
um, implicit instruction. And what I'd like to go on to do now is to actually um, unpack what, from the definition that we looked at earlier, six key um, aspects of social and emotional learning that are most appropriate and relevant to develop in the early years. And we'll have a look at these six key aspects and practical examples for um, each one. So the first area that I would like us to have a look at is I know who I am. And this is to do with developing children's self-awareness, self-confidence, self-esteem, all things that you mentioned crucially in your comments in the chat box earlier. And the significant adults around children in the early years act like a mirror and actually reflect back to children how they see themselves. If children feel they are care cared for in the kind of responses that they get from adults, they'll feel positive self-esteem. And of course, this is part of a process. Children of three, four, five years old actually are in the process of developing their identity and self-concept. So I know who I am is actually about I'm getting to know who I am and I am developing that kind of self-esteem and positive self-concept on the way. And an example of how we might integrate this with our language classroom um, when you think of the work we do with full, small children, we work on areas that are close to the child and we might do things like, you know, identifying the parts of our face. So my eyes, my nose, my mouth, okay? And something that I like doing, I have a class set of, sometimes actually in preschool classrooms, there is a mirror down one wall of the classroom. And that's fantastic. The children can stand in front of the mirror as they are in this picture here and identify all together my eyes, my nose, my mouth, and then talk about them being special. My eyes are special, my nose is special, my mouth is special. Or we might have, as I have here, I have a little um, class set of these little pocket um, mirrors that are, um, they're made of plastic, they're, they're, they're for safety reasons, they're not, if you drop them on the floor, nothing actually happens. So they don't, they don't have very high definition reflection, but you can get the children to um, look at themselves in the mirror and identify um, their, their features. And then, you know, something that we might typically do is get the children to draw a self-portrait um, of themselves, okay, looking in the mirror, so this is all about noticing and observation and feeling special about myself, because as teachers, what we might then do is actually take turns to, like in a story time circle context, to show the different pictures, not all of them in one lesson, but over time, take a child's book, hold up the picture, children identify the features, um, the rest of the class guesses who they are, and the child feels extremely proud that their self-portrait is um, being shown to the class in this way. So um, incorporating then learning that um, face vocabulary with developing um, self-esteem. Um, another area to do with I know who I am is developing self-awareness and understanding and identifying um, our, our feelings, feelings um, that we have, our feelings and our emotions. And um, here, just um, to give an example of the kind of feelings that we might work with, we've got um, yellow there is happy, blue is sad, red is angry, green is calm, purple is sleepy and grey um, is, is, is scared. 
And, um, you know, because sometimes I feel, sorry, I must just have a, in the preschool classroom, that sometimes what I like to think of as a tyranny of happiness, that as teachers, we expect and require children to be smiling and happy all the time. But actually, life is not like that. And even for four-year-olds, you know, we're, we're not necessarily happy all the time. And the first step towards knowing who I am and also being able to manage my feelings is to understand um, what they are. And there are kind of lots of activities that we can do in relation to incorporating feelings into our teaching. For example, we might, as part of our classroom routine, use our puppet um, to ask, how are you? And children respond with their different feelings and also for you to share your feelings with, with the children, you know, that you're not always happy. You know, um, maybe today I'm, I'm angry because there was no bus or my bus was late, but I'm happy to see all of you. So that actually we're introducing the idea that feelings are more complex um, than just one feeling at a time. And in this particular activity here, when children have got the idea that we don't feel just one feeling all the time, we can get them to, you know, colour in those circles for the feelings that they sometimes have, and also um, to colour the face there to show how they're feeling now. And it's actually quite interesting when you do this, um, because children invariably don't just colour the face one colour, yellow for happy or green for calm they may choose several colors so they might choose they might color it partially yellow and partially blue and then when you actually ask them why they can't tell you in english because that would be too advanced but they can tell you in their own language and they might say something like well i'm i'm happy because we've got spaghetti for lunch today and I'm sad because my mummy can't come and pick me up from school today. And actually, in this kind of way, we're developing the language of feelings, of course, but we're also um, helping children to understand who they are, to build up their self-identity and their self-concept. OK, moving on. I know who I am, but also, we need to work with children as part of social and emotional learning to um, develop their social awareness, their empathy, which I've seen several times in the chat box, which is wonderful, their tolerance, their respect for others. We're moving gradually beyond egocentricity and learning to decenter and think of others and not just themselves. And I think in this context, one of the things um, that is really powerful is for us to use um, stories. And stories, as we know, you know, they develop thinking skills, they develop language, they're engaging, they're enjoyable, and they can also play a role in developing um, social and emotional learning, and in this case, awareness of others and willingness to empathize with others. So actually, I'm going to tell you a little story now. And what I'd like you to think about and put your, um, put your ideas um, in the chat box. It's fabulous to see how many ideas you've all, you've all got. And I just want to ask you three questions. So I'd like to ask you to tell me, how is social and emotional learning integrated into this story? And then more prosaically, um, what is the key vocabulary and language children are learning through this story? And um, the third thing, what are the kind of features that help you that help you to support children's understanding of the story? Now, obviously, we can tell stories in many different ways. We can use picture books, we can use story cards. Sometimes we may have a recording of the, of the story, and sometimes we may have 
uh, an animated video of the story, an animated version of the story as well. And obviously, there aren't right answers here, although I have to say that for me personally, when I'm introducing a story to children for the first time, I really like to tell it myself so that I can interact with the children as I tell it. I can ask questions, I can repeat, I can gauge their response um, and, and act accordingly. So I'm going to tell you um, this little story now, okay, and the story is called A New Friend. Um, and it is a story about developing empathy. And I'm going to tell it to you, uh, not really as if you're a group of children, because, um, because obviously you're teachers. So bearing in mind that um, and the questions that I've asked you, I will tell you a, a, a version of the story. OK, so it's time for school. Mrs. Cat, by the way, is the teacher. And she says, Good morning, children. And the children say, Good morning, Mrs. Cat. This is Katie Kangaroo. Katie is a new girl. Hello, Katie. Welcome to our school. This is Katie's first day at school. Please tell Katie, what do you do at school? They all put up their hands in turn. I draw, I colour, I paint at school. Very good. I sing, tra la 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 la, and I dance at school. Very good, Leo, Leo the leopard. I count at school, one, two, three, and I think at school. Ha ha, yes, you think a lot, don't you, Dylan? Yes. I like school. Katie Kangaroo. Oh no, I don't like school. I want to go home. Katie sits at a table with Mimi. Please don't be sad, Katie. I want to help you. Do you want to draw, Katie? No, I don't. Do you want to colour, Katie? No, I don't. I'm sad. I don't like school. I want to go home. Oh dear, poor Katie. Do you want to count, Katie? No, I don't. Do you want to paint, Katie? No, I don't. I'm sad. This is where I would get the children to join in with me with this repetition. I'm sad. I don't like, I can almost hear you saying it at home. I don't like school. I want to go home. Oh dear, poor Katie. Ha ha, ding a ling a ling a ling a ling. It's time for sport. Off you go now, children. I want to run. I want to run too. I want to run. And Katie says, I want to jump. Come on, Katie. The children go outside. Mimi says, I've got an idea. Let's jump. Oh, yes. Look at me. Very good, Leo. Look at me. Very good, Dylan. And look at me. Oh, wow. Amazing. Go, Katie, go. You're fantastic. Katie jumps around the playground. Boing, boing, boing. Oh, thank you, Mimi. I'm happy. I like school now. I don't want to go home. And I've got a new friend. I'm happy too. Okay, 
So there's the end of our little story. Can I see the answers to the questions? What, what language and vocabulary is it developing? Uh, what else did I ask? How is social and emotional learning integrated? integrated? Fantastic. And how do we help children understand the story? Everyone, everyone has a talent and they have a lovely activities. Fantastic. Wonderful. Preferences. Yeah. Wonderful ideas. Absolutely. Spot, spot on. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the vocabulary, they're obviously learning school activities. Do you want to? I want to. Although, of course, at this age, many children will not be ready to produce those whole chunks of language. Um, and that, that's fine as well. Um, and social and emotional learning is obviously integrated in the way that Mimi realizes what Katie wants to do, gives her a chance to do it, and turns Katie around, and she's happy then at school. But I think the important thing for us to realize as teachers is this not, this is not that children then learn empathy. This is just the start um, of a process. And it's also better to let children internalize the message rather than making it too explicit. This is a point that Bettelheim makes very strongly in his book on um, the analysis of fairy tales, that actually we need to let children gradually discover this for themselves. But we can remind children of the story whenever appropriate. Remember how Katie, uh, how Mimi helped Katie, for example. Okay. Oh, another quick example there of um, awareness of others um, is in terms of when we talk about our families, that all our families are different in terms of size, in terms of their members, and actually all our families are special, they are all unique, and although we do this in a very light way, we can see here um, the differences between different families before children um, draw their own and that actually this is something for us to value that all our families are um, different. Okay, so moving on now to the next um, area to do with cooperation and I've seen this several times in the chat box, the importance of cooperation as an aspect of social and, and emotional learning. For children to develop those relationship skills, to be able to work as um, part of a team and actually in many ways to start off with um, we can learn to cooperate by cooperating to learn so for example in a very simple clapping day it came if you're watching with somebody else you could do this now we might say a little cooperation rhyme which would go like this and we do the clapping actions with a partner. Let's work together. Let's cooperate. I help you, you help me. It's great, it's great. Let's work together. Let's cooperate. I share with you, you share with me. It's great, it's great. Okay, so there we're actually um, learning to cooperate by actually cooperating physically with a partner. And part of cooperation is also, of course, to do with learning to take turns. So in a little activity, um, this one based on transport, we might have, um, you know, uh, picture cards turned face down so that you can't see them. And children take turns to, in a very simple game, to turn over the cards and say, do you want to go by bike or let's go by bike or possibly they just say bike okay and their partner responds um yes or no depending on what card um gets turned over and the other area um to look at in terms of cooperation is to do with working on projects now working on projects with this age group is quite challenging but it's important to lay those foundations for more complex projects that children will do later on. And I think the secret of working on projects at this age group is to start by getting the children 
to do something individually that leads to a cooperative outcome. So for example, here with food, they might use Play-Doh or Plasticine to make a food item of their choice and then put the food all together um, on a plate of plate that they decorate to make their own plate of food. And actually what we need to do as teachers is to reinforce the message that actually what we can achieve together is more um, than what we can do on our own. So the basis of learning to cooperate, really important there. Moving on to the next area, I can manage my emotions. And this, of course, links back to what we already saw about feelings. Managing emotions is to do with self-regulation, to do with learning to wait, to do with not having what you want immediately, to do with taking turns and keeping calm. And of course, there are many ways that we can help children manage their emotions. And But I want to focus here on actually the importance of routines for managing emotions. But actually, one of the ways we set up our parameters in the preschool class for learning, which I talked about much earlier, is through the way we do regular learning routines. And learning routines help children to feel safe, something that many of you have mentioned, but also to manage their emotions. So let's have a look at this little one now, this little routine for settling down. And this is a little rhyme that you need to say very quietly and doing the actions and actually uh, convey to children that you want them to be as quiet as possible. And we go like this, I'm quiet as a mouse, as still as can be, no noise at all, look at me. And we're all completely quiet and we can start whatever it is we're doing. Another example is if you work in circle time on the floor with children, which I expect some of you do, but some of you perhaps don't. And if you don't work in circle time, we could also do this sitting on our chairs at our tables. Um, but we might, we, we, we might want to change the line, cross your legs if we're doing that and just repeat, sit down. You know, if it doesn't work for you, you just kind of adapt it. So this is actually to get everyone ready and focused in circle time. So we say, sit down, cross your legs, hands together, just like me, ready to learn, ready to play. Let's start our lesson. One, two, three. OK. And actually, when you do little learning routines like this, if one day you forget to do them or you haven't got time, um, children will very often remind you. And this is very much to do with um, helping children to manage their emotions and get into an appropriate mood um, for, for learning. OK, and, and the last example here is a mindfulness chant. And I think um, some of you will probably be aware that the whole area of mindfulness and focusing on the moment uh, is something that is, I guess, quite trendy and fashionable at the moment. Um, and I'm not using it for this reason, but more to do with actually getting children to breathe in and out and be aware of themselves can actually get them into a relaxed and settled um, mood. So this mindfulness chant where we just do the actions with the children, I breathe in, I breathe out. One, two, three. I close my eyes. I listen. I'm as calm as can be. And then again, of course, the next verse with opening my eyes. And it actually has a very positively settling effect um, on the children. Okay, so the importance of, I mean, there are plenty of other ways of managing 
emotions as well, but focusing on learning routines, there's a lot there that we can do to um, help children learn to independently manage their own emotions. Okay, so moving on now to our fifth area um, that we've also um, actually mentioned already, and this is to do with making choices. Making choices that we saw is so important in laying the foundations of independence and autonomy. And at this age also, um, I can make choices very much relates to initial values education, where actually we are trying to encourage children to make positive, responsible choices about their own um, behavior. And values education is something that can very often arise from stories. Uh, for example, um, in the little story we had with Katie Kangaroo, the value there could be being kind and helpful um, to a friend. And actually encouraging children to think about their behaviour and choose to behave in a responsible way. So just um, a couple of little examples here. Sorry, I whizzed past one. Okay, a couple of little examples here that would again, as I say, not be isolated like this, but would arise from a context, whether a story or a song. So choosing to be tidy, for example, and children learning to recognize and value the appropriate behavior. And here in this one, choosing to be polite, and of course, using those little words that we love in English so much, please and thank you, okay. Um, and actually, you know, colouring the pictures to show um, to show what to show what they do. So the the whole thing of making choices, I think, quite often as teachers, we hold the reins so close at preschool that we don't give children opportunity um, for choice and to think about their behaviour and the reasons for doing things um, themselves. Okay, and moving on then to our last area, um, and this is I can reflect. And I'm thinking here particularly that we want, we need to start to develop children's metacognitive skills and their ability to review and evaluate their own learning, keeping in, keeping in, leading in time to their ability to set their own um, short and long-term goals and become responsible, um, self-driven learners. And I think we need to incorporate regular activities to encourage self-evaluation and reflection. And um, this helps children's ability to plan, monitor, evaluate um, their own learning. And as well as the immediate benefits, it, it um, sets the foundations for the future. And learning reviews are often most effective, well they are most effective, when they're part of a cycle of um, before, during and after, if you like, to put it very simply, whereby before we actually think about what, it, what our objectives are, what we're going to learn, that during we participate and follow and work independently and make choices as appropriate, and afterwards, we think about and evaluate. And here is the key thing, not just what we've done, but um, how we've done it. And of course, this needs to be in a child age appropriate um, and child friendly way. So, it, for example, here, um, the children might draw around the vocabulary items that they know that they have learned. There are not right answers. They choose the ones they know. And they also, um, with the teacher's help and prompting, and possibly in their mother tongue or shared language, look at the things they've learned. But what is on the page is just um, one minor part of the process, which is actually engaging children 
in talking about how they think they learn, how 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 did how did the various which activities did they enjoy, how did they help them to learn. So, in conclusion, um, we've had a look at what cell is, and we've also had a look at a range of um, social and emotional learning related activities and how we can use these to not only develop language, which of course is our principal aim as language teachers, but to develop these aspects of cell. And we've looked at learning routines, stories, songs and rhymes. Well, I've actually resisted singing, um, singing a song to you, but some of those rhymes that we did, there are sung versions to those. And when in doubt, you can always adapt a familiar nursery rhyme tune, such as Frere Jaca, for singing a song. We've looked at values activities, projects, and learning um, reviews. And we've also um, unpacked in child-friendly terms six key aspects of social and emotional learning that I think are most relevant and appropriate for children in the early years. And I believe really passionately that when we work this way with children, integrating social and emotional learning into and the development of language skills into everything we do, we not only help to ensure that children become engaged, confident, responsible, and motivated learners now, but we also lay the foundations for their future success, not only in education, um, but in, in their lives. Okay, so that brings me to um, the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. And I'm happy um, to have five minutes or so. If you have any questions that you would uh, um, like to ask me. Um, Carol, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hi, so, um, oh, hi everybody. We will have uh, a couple of minutes to ask Carol some um, questions. Firstly, I just um, want to run through a few things. Um, did you enjoy the webinar most of all? It was the best webinar I have attended. I've got somebody here who enjoyed the webinar as well. That's great. That's great. Thank you for the lovely comments. I'm looking for questions here. So, um, is it before possible? we get to questions, okay, go on, Carol, did you pick up a question? No, no. Okay. So listen, everyone, I, I know that you all want to know about the certificate and we have special guest here, Mimi. Mimi, would you like a certificate? She would like a certificate. So you're going to get your advancing learning certificate sent to you directly to your email inbox so you don't need to do um, anything at all uh, that will come in the next um, couple of days and if you have any colleagues who weren't able to join us um, today then the, a recording of this webinar will be available on our youtube channel um, next week and um, before we get to the questions i just i mean every time we do these webinars it's amazing that we have hundreds of teachers from around the world and we really appreciate um, you taking an hour out of your time uh, um, to spend that um, with us. And, and a very big thank you to the Macmillan team here, to Kasia, Piotr and Sonali who work behind the scenes. And, and Carol, a huge thank you to you from everybody at Macmillan Education. Um, a few minutes. So anyone got a question for Carol? Please type just, it in the chat. I just, I just caught a question there about whether um, we can apply this in one-to-one -one teaching that some of you are obviously teaching individual children and I would say yes absolutely and actually what a privilege to be in that one-to-one -one context to be able to um, to be able to apply it apply it so kind of systematically and uniquely and personally um, and in fact I would say that we can apply this you know whether we have one child or whether we have 25 children as they do in Spain or 45 or 60 or however many you have I think um, we're going to be making the most of our job as language teachers if we pay attention to these areas 
as well. How can songs be used to foster cooperation? Um, I think songs can be used in many ways to foster cooperation. I mean, um, when we, with this age group of children, we often act out songs and acting out the songs together with a partner uh, implicitly involves a certain level of cooperation. Um, and actually the text of songs themselves um, may include things like, you know, playing together, sharing together, which are promoting the whole area of cooperation as well. What, what do you recommend for those children who want to get ahead and don't wait for instructions and don't not bother with routine. Well, actually, I, I do feel that routines are really important, but we can also um, introduce a certain flexibility into our routines. And for those children who are ahead of the game, if you like, um, they can take on more of the language involved in routines. I'm just thinking of a little example, for example, of um, the weather routine where you might go over to the window and ask children what's the weather like and um, of course we're going to have differentiated abilities in our classes and there may be a child who you can actually ask you know to, to take on the teacher's part of the role in that in that routine so I think we can always look for ways um, in which um, children can 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 achieve at the level they're ready to do so. For example, acting out that story with Katie, the kangaroo. Some children will be able to say, do you want to colour? Do you want to? Yes, I do. No, I don't. Other children, you know, may only be able to say colour, paint, but they are achieving at their level. And I think as teachers, we, lean, we need to learn to value that, not be judgmental about it, and think about um, children at this age group um, as their learning potential developing in different stages and at different rates, and we need to value the way all our children are learning. Wait, where's it? what do you think? Oh, about ghosts and other creatures during Halloween? Well, that, that, that's a very interesting question. And I think it's also a culturally sensitive question. And I think it depends very much on your context. I mean, personally, I would feel very reluctant to introduce anything at all in my class that is likely to make children anxious or, or scared. And I think um, Halloween, you know, that, that whole area of kind of witches and so on, can be quite scary for young children. And so you might think, actually, I'm not going to do this. Maybe what I will focus on is a pumpkin lantern, for example, which won't have that element. So I think we as teachers have to make um, these kind of choices for our own children, our own context, and to conform with our own beliefs um, at all times, really. While children developing their self when they have a strong sense of Uh huh. Okay, so a question there about the egocentricity of children. My my book, my all all about me. And I think um, we can't do anything that is going to dramatically change things around. But again, it's part of a process, and part of a process that is going to take time, and that we can. Um, reinforce very often by, you know, giving the reasons for things. You know, it's 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 my book. It's my book. I'm not going to share it. Um, uh, but wouldn't you like to see someone else's book, for example? Sorry, that's not a very that's not a very good example. But I'm trying to think of the way we reinforce constantly um, the value of working with others, of sharing. But at the same time of recognizing, you know, that um, children also have a right to their things and their um, property and that other other children need to respect that too. 
So, Carol, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I can let me see a question. How, how can we use the book due to the topic or it's a special? I'm not quite sure I understand that question. I mean, I think um, I think if, the, if there is if there is a topic that you want to develop in the classroom, then I think it's really valuable that you go ahead and do that and maybe use it, consider using as a starting point for that, possibly uh, a picture book, possibly an object, possibly a song, and actually thinking about the kind of language and vocabulary that might derive from that and the kind of activities that would be suitable. But I would say absolutely go for doing that whenever you can. Ah, a question here about home education being in line with what we do at school. Um, and this is another hugely important area with preschool, I think, is the, um, the real importance of a link between home and school. That actually we explain to parents what we're doing, what we hope to achieve, how they can actually help and support their children's learning and get them on board, not only with the kind of methodology that we're using, but the kind of um, values that underpin what we're doing in the classroom. Oh, somebody writing stories for young children. Is it okay to share them? I think it's wonderful if you share them. And who can you get better feedback from than children themselves if their story is for young children? That's certainly the kind of feedback that I value hugely on the stories that I write is the responses from children themselves. So, Carol, I think I think you've had lots of questions there, and um, the feedback we've seen in the chat box has, has been amazing. Lots of interest, lots of questions. So, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you back again at some point to do another webinar. <laughs>